welcome to Talking Europe on France 24. Now, cod, herring, sole and place, some of Europe's most eaten fish and four of the species whose populations are said to be at renewed risk right now. This after European ministers decided recently to continue overfishing, despite a long-standing commitment to end that practice by the year 2020. A decision that sparked an accusation of betrayal from the marine protection network seas at risk. Well, it all comes at a particularly stormy time for European seas and those who sail in them. With the United Kingdom no longer an EU member, Boris Johnson has promised British fishermen that he will take back control of their waters. Well, our guests today are all members of the European Parliament's Fisheries Committee. And to start the show, grab your waterproofs because we're going to take you on board a French fishing boat in the English Channel, one of the busiest areas of water in Europe and one of the most hotly contested. Down in the sea, there's no wall dividing English and French waters. The fish don't know where they are. The EU tries to protect fish stocks by allocating maximum catch limits for different species to each country. They're known as quotas, and member states can sell or lease them to each other. The Dutch have bought out more than 20% of England's quota. They're the bankers of the sea, says Olivier. When he spots one fishing in the same zone, he refuses to switch course. He's just in front. Tell him I won't move. The vessel is Dutch, but because it owns English quota, it's flying the United Kingdom's flag. Ask if he just wants me to go back to Boulogne and leave the zone to him. You want uh, I go back uh, to Boulogne? The French are being sarcastic. No, so maybe if I, uh, if I run all uh, turn earlier to east, so after this, uh, no uh, problem uh, with us. If Britain breaks away from the EU's quota system and restricts access to European fishermen, they'll all have to cram into a smaller area of sea. That could lead to overfishing. For now, the EU says its quotas have allowed fish stocks to improve. But there's a big drawback. There's a ban on fishing sea bass. We've just caught one by accident. A sea bass which weighs four kilograms, that's 80 euros. So we have to throw away 80 euros into the sea, even though it's dead. This winter we were targeting squid. Four tons of sea bass got into our net. We had to throw them back into the sea. Throwing dead fish back into the sea because they fall outside the EU's quotas angers fishermen across Europe. You can go to every port in France and all the fishermen will tell you the same thing. 96% of British fishermen voted to leave the EU and it wasn't for the hell of it. They voted Brexit because they're fed up. That report was from Claire Pacalin, Alexandra Renard and Julien Sauvager. Well, let's introduce our guests for you now. We have with us one of the Fisheries Committee's vice uh, presidents, Peter van Dalen, a Dutch MEP from the European People's Party Group. Hello there. Hi. Uh, next to you, we have uh, Grace O'Sullivan, who is an Irish MEP. You're actually the spokesperson on marine issues for the Irish Greens. Hi, Catherine. And uh, across the table, we have Manuel Pizarro, a Portuguese MEP from the Socialists and Democrats group. Hi, Catherine. Well, thanks all very much for being our guests on the debate today. First question, really. Uh, this uh, deadline for setting fishing quotas at sustainable levels is long overdue. There was a preliminary deadline of 2015, a sort of a second last minute deadline of 2020. Uh, and it's been missed. Uh, why, Peter van Dalen, have EU ministers missed this deadline and how much of a problem is it? I think the fisheries policies of the European Union, especially in the North Sea, is a worldwide example. Uh, since for almost all the stocks in the North Sea, we fish at a sustainable level called MSY. And in total in the EU, out of the 78 stocks we are dealing with, 62 of them are now fished at a sustainable MSY level. And we came from five mm -hmm. in 2009. So my statement today is 
we had a very successful North Sea fishing policy, also with sacrifices from the fishermen and fisherwomen themselves by scrapping boats, etc. And we should set the North Sea an example for other sea basins in the European Union and around the world. So I would say follow the North Sea example because of the North Sea, we have a very good sustainable fisheries policy. Has there been enough progress, Gracie Sullivan? Well, look, um, you know, overfishing is overfishing and it should be absolutely um, unacceptable by any of us MEPs. And I think, as you said, in 2015, there was a, a deadline there. Um, now it's 2020 and we are not going to uh, meet um, our uh, obligations in that regard. And that, that is shocking. But nevertheless, what uh, Peter says there, um, is true that there are some good news stories, that mm -hmm. there are some cases where management has worked, mm -hmm. and that's what we have to strive for. So it uh, I means stresses on the, the ocean uh, and on the seas is greater than ever with regard to climate change as well. Um, so it, more than ever, we have to look at true conservation, true sustainability, but we must get on with it. Mm. Yeah. One of the main priorities, Manuel Pizarro, you said, uh, is uh, protecting the oceans and fishing resources. Uh, what do you make of this missed deadline? Do you agree that some progress is, is a good thing? Yes, I think that we must uh, put the value on these progresses. If you see the picture, the picture is not very beautiful. We should, be in, in, we should not allow overfishing in any case. Mm -hmm. However, if you see the film, the, the film, the things are quite better than they were mm -hmm. 10 or 5 years mm -hmm. ago. I think that there is, there are very well, uh, the common fisheries policy of the European Union is a, a success case in protection of the uh, mm -hmm. marine uh, areas. And that, but I should, I think that we must uh, see that we must go away, go away ahead from that uh, we have arrived until now. And just to make clear that this was a decision that's made at the ministerial level no, by the no. ministers of the European no. Union member states' government. So uh, what influence can you all have as MEPs on achieving the goals that you all seem to share in, in terms of overfishing? Can you have any influence? Well, I think if we look at, um, you know, that clip you just showed there and about um, discard and that in terms of selectivity, the type of fishing methods that are used, we can influence the direction in that regard. But also that we do have influence and we, we are part of the Fisheries Committee, um, PESH, and, um, you know, we have to uh, insist that if there are, um, and we've signed up to obligations, that we must adhere to them. Because otherwise we're looking at a, a problem. But mm -hmm. it's a kind of a mixed bag, uh, so to speak, because there are good examples, but there's also a problem of overfishing of some species. I think the influence of the European Parliament on the common fisheries policy is huge, because we set the targets for the common fisheries policies. One of the main targets now is selectivity. Mm -hmm. We just want to catch the fish we want to consume and we want to prevent that fish is thrown back into the seas. We had a system developed in the Netherlands called pulse fishing, which was very selective. Unfortunately, this parliament decided not to go ahead with that. But we need to improve the selectivity in order to prevent uh, throwing back unwanted bycatch. That's one. Two. We have two vulnerable sea basins in the European Union. The one is the Baltic Sea and the other one is the Mediterranean Sea. In the Baltic Sea, which is an almost closed sea, there is a lot of pollution and we need to make sure that the water quality there improves uh, in order that the fish can live thereon. And in the Mediterranean, we need to cooperate also with countries in Africa to make sure that the overfishing in the Mediterranean for instance, on tuna-like fish, is stopped. So we are quite well on our way, but we need some improvement. Does it anger you, as the committee that sets those quotas, to have ministers say in 2015, yes, we will meet the 2020 deadline, and then just disregard it at the meeting in December 2019? Yes, you know, but we must have a balanced approach. Yes, of course, we must uh, look at the marine resources. It's essential for everybody, including for the fishermen, for mm -hmm. the future of the fishermen. But it's also necessary it's, uh, to look at the sustainability, economical and social. But if, on the one hand, there, there are arguments, I think, Grace, you said it yourself, that overfishing jeopardises livelihoods of the fishermen who rely on healthy fish stocks, but then 
we're saying that we're allowing overfishing to help livelihoods. It's, but, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit however, of a clash there. However, if you look at the last 10 year period, you see that more and more stocks are becoming uh, sustainable. Mm -hmm. It says that the, the measures that have been adopted are correct, mm -hmm. but I, I think that we must keep attention on that because we should not have the political temptation of disregarding the scientific advice. Exactly. I, I was going to absolutely agree with you in terms of scientific advice that we adhere to that. But also that we listen to NGOs, so members from the um, Seas at Risk or many other uh, NGOs who put us under quite some pressure and it's important that, that we um, respect that, but also we respect the stocks uh, because sustainability is key to the livelihoods of um, the fishers community and the good food that we eat from the sea. Well, another pressure that I mentioned right at the beginning is Brexit. Of course, the EU and UK renegotiating their relationship on all issues, including one of those very hot button ones, fishing. Um, the UK, you know, has been, there have been voices that have been very strong on this. Boris Johnson saying he's going to take back control of British waters. Uh, are you concerned that the EU is going to lose access, lose a large part of its access to a very rich area of fishing ground? How much of a, a worry is that for you, Peter van Dalen? I'm very worried. First of all, because we now have a regime on the North Sea by both the EU and the UK, which is a very good system. We have sustainable levels of all fish stocks, almost all fish stocks in the North Sea, due to a common policy we have had for over 30 years. And I'm really concerned that the UK now stops this very successful policy. That's one. Two, uh, we have been fishing in these waters together for even centuries um, and I think we should have a good agreement for the coming time to make sure that we keep on fishing which is both in the interest of the Dutch and other European fishermen and also for the UK and behind that is another interest the UK is exporting a lot of fish and fish products to the European mainland um, and I do not want to end in some sort of a uh, a trade war that we have to block this export mm -hmm. of UK fish products to the uh, mainland. I want to co cooperate and I do not want to have a, a war on fish or whatever. So, so we need to sit together and find a solution with equal treatment mm -hmm. and good trade relations. But you feel that the EU could be pushed, you feel, to a point of having to block fish exports from the UK? Is that what you're suggesting? Well, you see, this is the stick behind the door. Should the uh, UK cut the North Sea in half and forbid EU fishermen to fish in the uh, western parts of the North Sea near the British coast, then it might be necessary for the European Union to take this stick and to combat the UK mm -hmm. by putting high tariffs on fish and fish products on their exports to the mainland. And we know that with trade wars, there are only losers. So we should not go that far. We should reach yes. an agreement. I think that uh, we must be clear. That's the position of the European Parliament. The, there, there must be a complete reciprocity. If the uh, UK wants, and we agree that they should want to have free access to the, to the market, to the, to the Union, uh, European Union market for their fish and their fishery products, we should have the same degree of access to the water and to the ports of the, of mm -hmm. the UK. No one is going to win uh, a kind of uh, commercial uh, battle in mm -hmm. the sea, in the North Sea. This is, uh, there will be only losers. And I think that we must convince them that it's our common interest to cooperate in the area of uh, fishing. I suppose, uh, especially for Ireland being yes. a member of the EU, um, it's critical. Cut off from the rest of the European Union by the <laughs> UK, it's, it's, geographically yeah, speaking. It's really critical that these negotiations are done mm. in a very constructive and peaceful mm. uh, way because um, I suppose traditionally, you know, there was often that sense of, uh, you know, that the war's at sea almost and that we're very much hoping that we won't 
have a return to that, but that um, the UK will recognise um, the uh, market they have mm -hmm. in the EU mm. uh, countries uh, and the value it is to their economy. And I mean, there's going to be so many changing parts mm -hmm. in the UK as well, at least with the union, we, we're still a big, large block of 27 countries. Mm -hmm. um, and Ireland has uh, been working very well mm. uh, in that partnership over the last number of years. So we're hoping that the access to UK waters mm -hmm. Irish will continue um, and that um, and more or less status quo mm. will be maintained. Yeah. I just uh, got time for one last quick question to everybody, really. Uh, we have seen in the last couple of weeks, since the UK formally left the EU, uh, the first week of February, uh, around Guernsey, which is a, a UK crown dependency, uh, French fishing boats were, had their access to those ports blocked and there seemed to be a mini fishing war sprung up around the Channel Islands. Given that, given the strong rhetoric in just a couple of words, how confident does that make you feel that this is going to be the kind of calm negotiation that you're all clearly hoping for? I'm pretty much concerned with what is happening. I, I think that nobody in the EU can be calm about what is happening in the relation, in future relation with the UK. But uh, I think that we must fight for a good relation in the future because it's of interest of everybody in Europe. I would say we have to work towards really good um, a solution for both the UK and the EU27. What do you make of the political rhetoric around all this, Peter van Dalen, just briefly? Well, I really hope that common sense will win on both sides of the channel because we can only work together by making the North Sea sustainable and keeping it sustainable and on the other hand, to prevent a trade war. So we must work together and find a common solution. All right, thank you all very much for being my guest for this debate. I'm sure we'll be talking about this topic for many months to come. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much for now. Thanks to you as well for watching. See you soon on France 24 for more editions of Talking Europe. France is famous for its generous social safety net. It's been said the country is a paradise inhabited by people who think they're living in hell. Well, critics say it's a Byzantine ball and chain for the economy that's unsustainable in the long run, while defenders say it's a treasured jewel that needs protecting. So just how good are the benefits of the French system? What do the French think about it, really? And who foots the massive bill? Join us for this episode of French Connections Plus, where we explore the hot-button issue that is France's social safety net. French Connections Plus, presented by Jeannie Godula and Florence Vilmino.